one of the pastor here, and we are glad that you chose this place where you encounter God this morning. We're looking forward to worshiping with you. I wanted to bring your attention to the back, the back middle third of the bulletin for some upcoming events. Uh, on the 9th, it's Family Bingo Night. The, so then I'll be at 5, and bingo will be from 6 to 8. And I've heard there's some pretty good prizes that you can win when you come and play bingo. And then also on the 17th, we'll be having a, a workshop about how to share your faith on social media. And that, that can be as uh, easy as liking the church's Facebook page, uh, or if you tweet, doing something and, and sending a tweet. But just basic things on how to share your faith without uh, going door to door. Because evangelism can be scary if you think about it in that, that way. But there's multiple ways to share your faith with uh, the people you meet on a day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> And so, let's continue to worship in prayer, so please join me. God, we come today to gather in your presence, with friends, with family, with this faith community, to honor and, and glorify you and reflect on the, the past week and how we have experienced your goodness, how we have experienced your presence in our life. And we come today to fill our cups so we can be full of the Spirit as we go forward from this place of worship to serve you and to show people your love, grace, and compassion. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Please rise as we sing How Great Thou Art, and the words will be on the screen, but they'll also be your general on number 77.
us, O Lord, to wear your blessings of compassion. Every day there are many ways in which we can offer help to others. Help us, O Lord, to be ready to reach out to all in need. Come, let us worship the one who prepares us for service. Let us sing our songs of praise to the one who has healed us. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing all things bright and beautiful on page 147 of your hymns.
in these facilities, but you see someone, let's, let's, say, let's start here, who plays on the playground? Everybody play on the playground? Yeah. Yeah? And so, can I ask you a question, Tyler? When your brother hurt his finger, how did you feel? Bad? And did you want to help him? Yeah, so that's compassion, right? That's compassion because you wanted to help your brother. Is, is there anybody else that's been helping your brother? Is it okay, Kaden, if I use you as a way for people to show compassion? Sure, thank you. Is there a, how have people been helping you, Kaden? <coughs> By asking if he's okay or not, yeah. What's another way we can help someone that's hurting, Marley? By asking them if they're okay and helping them out. Yeah, that's a good one too. Is there any other ways that you can show people that you love or care for them?
sent out his laborers into his harvest. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. We may be seated, I believe, as we sing, Let There Be Peace on Earth, down on page 431. <laughs>
are someone yourself that is dealing with um, thoughts of hopelessness or helplessness. Compassion is something that we all need and that we're all called to help with. My favorite part of today's scripture is that Matthew 9, 35 through 38 does not take a seminary student or a professor or a doctorate in ministry um, to, to tear that apart and to know what Jesus is saying in the scripture. It's my favorite part. I don't have to get out my seminary books and use my high-tech language and pretend I'm like my professors and use words that I don't use on a daily basis to know what Jesus is asking us to do. Then Jesus went about all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness. So I'm going to stop right there for a minute, and when I read this scripture, I don't just go to the part about where he tells us to do something. I, I take in the fact that Jesus was a pretty busy man. Jesus is traveling city to city, and if you can imagine, if you were one that was needing healing, or you were hurting, or you were going to the synagogue and you wanted to see Jesus, probably his time is pretty limited, right? It's, it's very limited, and like a celebrity, there's probably people going up to Jesus all the time and wanting Jesus to heal people over and over and over again, from city to city to city. So Jesus is extremely busy, and Jesus is focused on spreading the word of God, but also healing people. However, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. So even though Jesus is on this journey, and he's extremely busy, and he's traveling, and he's helping people, he still notices those that are marginalized <coughs> back in the corner. And in my mind, when I think of what this is like, I think of those people that are surrounding him and saying, please, Jesus, help me, help me, help me, I need help. But then I'm also thinking of those that aren't as outspoken, those that are quieter, those that are silently dealing with their pain, maybe they're back up on that mountaintop, and they're sitting there wondering and hoping and begging for God to help them, but they're not right down in Jesus' face and asking him. But Jesus still recognizes and sees them. Because that's Jesus, right? A little bit more intuitive things than we are. And Jesus takes that time to stop and notice. And then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. <coughs> Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So it doesn't stop there. It's not a matter of Jesus going to the people and immediately healing them or going to them and hearing everything that they're going through. I'm sure Jesus does that, but what does Jesus do? Jesus tells his disciples to go. He sends us to go and to do the work. And he says, there's lots of work to do, but there's not too many people to do it and to go and do that. And sometimes I think when we think about our faith and we think about our relationship with God and we want God and we ask God for all these things to help us through, we sometimes have to stop and remember that we are the answer to that prayer. And you've heard that for me before as I preach. We are that prayer. God is there and God's going to guide us through and it definitely takes God. But God's answer to prayer is me and you and all of us. But are we capable of being compassionate through all things, in all experiences, and all beliefs? Let's face it, some things are easier than others. I, think I, have I took a um, pill this morning for sinuses, and it's dragging me out, so have compassion on me. <laughs> One of these days, I promise it was my goal to get to a sermon without getting my water, but it's not going to be today. Compassion. Do you, can you have compassion for people and situations that you do not agree with? Think about that. I'm going to answer that out Suicide. I looked up the stats this week, and according to the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, 800,000 people, 800,000.
300,000 people die every year in the United States. That is one death every 40 seconds. And by the time we're done with worship today, 90 people will have taken their life to suicide. 90 people in one hour. Wow. Can we have compassion for situations that we may not understand? Some of us have dealt with depression <coughs> and suicide. I'm one of those. I know what it's like. I know what it's like to be the darkest dark. But if we don't understand it, and if we've never been there, can we understand and have compassion for those who struggle with those issues? You know, I think I shared um, in one of my sermons one time that when I went through my darkest times and suicide was something I did consider. Thank you, Jesus, I made it through that. But I had someone tell me, remember, if you kill yourself, you're going to hell. And I can tell you as someone, when you are in your darkest, darkest place, and it is a deep, dark place, and I can't describe it nearly as well as I would like to, but when you're in your darkest place, that doesn't matter. Because I remember thinking to myself, well, I mess up life. I have my life is out of control right now. I'm dealing with a trauma that I went through and I don't find my way out. That's, if that happens to me, then that just is one more thing that I've screwed up in life. By the way, I don't believe that. I believe that God reaches down in the darkest parts of where we are, and God cries with us, and God walks with us through those times. But the issue of suicide and bullying and, and meanness that's going on in our world is something that is very, very real. And I want to be very careful as I stand up here. I'm not trying to say that anything you've ever said has caused someone else to commit suicide. But can we have compassion for the fact that sometimes our words can hurt and not help? And don't stay in that part, part, that spot, because I know I myself have said, said things to people that are extremely painful that I definitely regret saying. But can we have the compassion to identify and to reach down and to say we're sorry and, and to work towards repentance and acceptance. Homelessness. 554,000 homeless people are in the United States on the streets in a given night. That's according to the U.S. Department of Housing. Topeka. According to the 2018 homeless count, and right now, I think they just started it this week, the homeless count is going on as we speak. There are people that go out and not only do they, because you know, homeless people, they can't turn in surveys and let us know they don't have addresses, right? So there's a group of people in town that get together and they go under the bridges and they go to the homeless camps and they look for people and they talk to the shelter. So these are where those numbers come from. But according to the 2018 homeless count, there are 419 homeless people in Topeka. 419 people, that was as of February of last year. Who wants to guess if that numbers went up a little bit? That's a lot of homeless people. And how many of those are children? That was one that I couldn't find the stats on. Have any of you ever been to the homeless shelter? Anybody? Has anybody ever taken a tour of where they sleep, like the Hope Center? Any of that? Yeah. One of the misconceptions that sometimes I think we have when we think about homeless people is that they think, well, they're just looking for a free place to go, right? They're, they're not taking responsibility, they're not getting jobs, they're looking for three meals and a cot. Right? If you've ever been in there on a busy time, Julie's nodding her head, some of you are nodding your head, you walk into the Hope Center and there are rooms that they have by themselves, and I really encourage you, if you've never done it, I encourage you, you all do a great job giving to that ministry, but I encourage you to take that time to with us when we go, or on yourself and go. But you walk in there, and yes, there's dorms on the family side where women and children or families, if they're married, can can stay, and they're all in a room together, but most of the time there are so many people, there's over 500, three to 500 
people there at the time. And you walk in where the TV room is, and it's just caught, 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 caught all the way. It's, it's a horrible way to live. And there's not much room, and there's no space. And imagine what it would be like. Imagine what it's like in your house with your family, if you have a husband, some of you have kids, grandkids. Imagine if you all sleep in the living room one night together. All of you, your entire family, grandkids, children, all of you in the same room. I don't know, but who likes that? <laughs> Let's be honest. We love our grandkids, we love our children, but that's a lot. Imagine now that you're in a room a little bit bigger than that with 300 of your closest friends. Homelessness is a very real epidemic. It's a real problem. And all of us are one or two or three paychecks away from having something horribly happen to us. Several years ago, Tina and I were on a mission trip and we had told the kids, do one thing, get out there and meet these people. And I forget sometimes that I was worried that they wouldn't talk, and they did. In fact, I said, go find someone and learn something about them. Well, the first thing that happened is they all went to the same person, <laughs> which is really funny. Um, and so when we finally got that out and I told them, you know, learn something, don't just learn their name, learn their story. And before we went in, I asked them, what is your, what's your vision of what a homeless person is? Guess what came out? Things that we hear from even all of us sometimes, right? Drugs, drinking, not being responsible, all those things. We met, I'll never forget him, he was a NASA physicist something, he had an official title, and he was homeless. He had lost his wife um, to cancer, and then two years later, he lost his daughter to cancer. He went from making way more than I can even imagine to absolutely having nothing. And whether or not there were good decisions or bad decisions and all of that, his homelessness didn't start because of a bad choice that he made. It started because he had medical bills that he couldn't pay for. We're talking about $900,000 and more in medical bills and having two of those. Do we have what it takes to be compassionate for issues such as that? Immigration. Hot topic, right? I promise I'm not going to get political. Immigrants are held in custody when they're brought into custody um, anywhere from two weeks up to 90 days. Now add the fact that some of them are traveling with children and infants and teenagers with them. As of September 2018, and I hope these numbers are down, I couldn't find solid enough numbers to give to you today, but as of September 2018, there were a total of 12,800 children who were in these detention centers. And we've seen the pictures, right? They're not in a holiday inn. They're not staying in a church. These are children that are in cages. Cages. One after the other after the other. And we've heard the stories children that have died while in custody. Now there's a part of us that can stop and say, well, maybe they put themselves there, right? They risked their life. Why would anybody leave the country they're going to and come here? They know this is going to happen, right? But within those stories of those that are running, there's also those that are running from persecution and murder and rape and destruction. And honestly, I have to be really honest with you, when I think about it as a mother and a wife, I've got to be really honest. If I lived in a country where my family was being persecuted and murdered, guess what? I'm going to break that law. Forgive me, God. I'm going to break that law, and I'm going to try everything in my power to do what I can to find safety for my child. Now I agree that there's ways to go about that and there's things that you need to do. But sometimes it's not as easy as we want to make it seem. My closest, closest friend's family became United States citizens when I was a junior in high school. Fourth of, or Fourth of July, <coughs> the first official um, weekend for her parents to be US citizens. 
It took them 22 years to become U.S. citizens, and that was completing the process. Hopefully by now that's changed a little. I am not up here, everyone, please hear me. I am not up here to say that this is right or wrong or that we should be doing this or we shouldn't be doing that. What I am up here saying is can we have it in our heart to be compassionate to those that are in situations much different than ourselves. Those children at the border, do they choose this? They didn't choose this. Those children that are homeless, did they choose this? They didn't choose this. We are dealing with a broken immigration system, a broken justice system, and a world that needs to honestly look a little bit more towards Jesus. Because it is these same people, when we read the scripture where it says, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless. So as easy as it is to make that scripture only about hunger and only about children and only about those things that we find socially acceptable based on where we live in our world, I'm asking you to remember that God called and God is talking about all those in our world. Not just our American children, but our children in this world. And whether we agree with what should be done, can we have compassion in our hearts to do something about it? It's easy to stand up here and say, they should have done this, this, and this. Okay, yes, maybe, true. But what does God say? What's the next step of that? Go and do this work. The harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. God is asking us to be those workers and to do something about this. So I'm asking you today, what are you doing in the world of compassion to help your neighbor, to help your family, and to help your world? A couple weeks ago, I had each of you hold on to your burdens. Do you remember that? Your rocks? Some of you, I loved doing it. It was, I, I'm so glad I did it. I watched some of you, some of you took handfuls. Like I had some, I saw someone with like five or six rocks in their hand. Some of you had one. And at the end, I said, take your burden, and when you're ready, put it back and know that God takes that burden with you. And some of you, decided that you weren't able to do that, that you weren't able to let go of that burden. And isn't that true? Isn't it a journey when we give our stuff, when we give everything over to God? So what is the answer to all of this? The answer is community and each one of us that we have been empowered to do something about all these things going on in our world. We can come here on Sunday morning and we can worship and we can have beautiful music and we can listen to Pastor Alex and Stephanie and wonder when the sermon's gonna get over and go on our ways, but that's not why we're here. I empower each of you to have compassion in your heart for the fact that Jesus is calling each of us to open our ears and our hearts and our minds without judgment and doing our part to make today and this and tomorrow for our children and grandchildren of tomorrow a better day. I'm asking each of you to remember that we have to do the hard stuff and that's even me. It's easy for me to stand up here and be compassionate and share with you that this is easy. That's why my title, Be Courageously Compassionate, because in my eyes, it seems like such an easy thing to do to be compassionate. But I realize it's not. It's not always easy to stand up against the grain. It's definitely not easy to stand up here right now and to share some of what I feel about some of this. But be courageous. Be willing to stand up. When you believe that something is wrong and you see someone being treated wrong, just like as I tell my boys, you be that person that stands up even if you're the only one standing. But know that you do not stand at that crossroads alone, that God is standing with you, God's guiding you, and God's helping you. And there will probably always be evil till the end of time. 
But every time we can put a ray of sunshine, a ray of light onto those evil things, we can bring light out of darkness. Finally, before I end, I would like you all to open your Bibles. I think it might also be projected. Um, I was going to do a unison prayer based on United Methodist Hymn 456 for courage to do justice. But I invite you to read this with me. And when you read it, I invite you to feel it. I invite you to believe it. We say this with me together. O oh Lord, open my eyes that I may see the needs of others. Open my ears that I may hear their cries. Open my heart to do so they need not be without succor. Let me not be afraid to defend the weak because of the anger of the strong, nor afraid to defend the poor because the anger of the rich. Show me where love and hope and faith are needed and use me to bring them to those places. And so open my eyes and my ears that I may this coming day be able to do some work of peace for thee. We Amen. Will you please bow your head in prayer? Gracious and loving God, I thank you for this opportunity to stand before this church and to share how I too fall short of having compassion for other people. God, I ask that you continue to work with each one of us, that you continue to open our hearts to love our neighbors as you have loved us. God, there are no easy answers to all that we have before us in our world. Our world is hurting with pain and war and separation. May each of us be that light and be that ray of sunshine so that we can overcome darkness and evil <coughs> with the promise of hope that you give each one of us. We know, God, that we cannot carry this on our own. We ask that you help each one of us pull together as a community and as a church to continue to do your work. Thank you, God, for all blessings that you've given us.
an illness, whether it's a life transition, and any other thing that we may going, be going through, Lord. We pause in this moment of time to lift up those specific requests to you. We also recognize that times in our lives where we have, have turned the eye on people who we should have shown compassion towards, whether it's driving down Highway 24 and someone's pulled over on the side of the road. We know there's times when we could have extended compassion and yet failed to do so. And so in this moment of silence, we confess those times to you and ask for the courage to do those things the next time they are made present to us. God, we thank you for Jesus who equips us and gives us the power to do things we think are unimaginable. Lord, we continue to pray as Jesus taught his disciples to pray by praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forget those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand, and let's, continue, let's sing our closing hymn, Here I Am, Lord, which is in your hymnal, number 593, and the words will also be on the screen.
to John. Invitation to John books are on the foyer, so be sure to get one of those on your way out. You have been chosen for a time such as this. May you go with the promise that we're not perfect, and God calls us just as we are to bring light out of darkness. May you leave here today with that light, with that promise that God walks with us. Thank mm -hmm. you.